Hi, I'm Rebecca Ball Carcel. Let's try to improve our poems by adding swerves. And what do I mean by swerve? I mean surprises, original flashes of the unexpected. Let me read you a poem that has very little swerving, and you'll see by contrast what I mean. She broke my heart in two. I didn't know what to do. I cried and I was blue. Be glad it wasn't you. Okay, well, I wrote that poem to be bad on purpose for this video. But why is it bad? Well, for one thing, the rhyme is very clunky and ordinary. We're not surprised by any of those rhyming words. The language choice is very predictable. The topic is highly predictable. So many poems are written about love or about heartbreak that the poet has to be quite original very surprising in order to come across as fresh and interesting. So this poem has not enough swerves, not enough surprises. Lee Young Lee, one of our great contemporary poets whose work I just love, he was asked about rhyme in a question and answer session after giving a reading. People said, well, why don't you use rhyme? And he said, well, I think Poems have two elements, chance and fate. By fate, he meant predictability, the expected. And by chance, he meant spontaneity and those creative swerves that I've been talking about. And he said, well, if I rhyme my poem, the predictability goes way up. As soon as I establish a rhyming pattern, whether it's every single line rhyming or every other line rhyming, I have already introduced an element of predictability, and now I'm going to have to work extra hard to put in swerves and, or as he would put it, to put in chants in order to balance out all of that expectedness that's already in the poem. The reader's going to get bored knowing, well, probably here comes another rhyme. Gee, didn't I know it would probably be that word? The, the more predictable it is, the more processed it feels or pre-digested. It doesn't feel fresh and original to the reader. So this was his answer about rhyme. And then he went on to talk about sonnets. And he said, well, it's really hard to write a sonnet nowadays because that sonnet is not just a straight area, but almost a highway. People have written so many sonnets in the last hundreds of years that there's a great element of predictability. We already know if it's a sonnet, it'll have 14 lines. It'll probably have iambic pentameter, that is 10 syllables per line in a particular rhythm. It'll probably have a certain rhyme scheme that's traditional. Likely it will be about love. These are all the conventions of a sonnet. And if you can write a great, fresh, original sonnet, well, wow, I'm excited. Share it with me. But it's hard to do because we have so many elements already decided for us and the reader is already unexcited about your contribution to this form. You've got to make the reader excited and show the reader how you're going to do something special with it. And it's very hard to introduce swerves into a formal poem that has so many constraints already. It's not impossible, but it's hard. Let me read you a poem that I think incorporates both this element of predictability and surprise really well. This is by Linda Paston, and she is another one of our great contemporary poets. The title is Writing While My Father Dies. There is not a poem in sight, only my father running out upstairs, and me without a nickel for the meter. The children hide before the television, shivering in its glacial light. And shivering, I rub these words together, hoping for a spark. It's a sad poem, and the title immediately tells us, Writing While My Father Dies. This is not a swerve part. This is a straight-ahead part to establish the scene, to establish the situation, so the reader knows clearly, okay, I'm writing about my father dying. There is not a poem in sight, 
Here we have a little swerving. We're used to the phrase, there is not a blank in sight. Maybe, you know, there is not a gas station in sight. But we're not used to saying, there's not a poem in sight. That's unusual. That's a little surprise. A small swerve. Only my father running out upstairs. Again, we have the same kind of swerve. Language that we're used to, but the word father is the surprise. We think of running out of milk or running out of gas, again, but we don't think of running out of life or my father running out of life. This is unusual, and so that's a swerve. She goes on, only my father running out upstairs and me without a nickel for the meter. Once again, she takes a common expression, a nickel for the meter, meaning a parking meter. You have to feed coins in it to buy time for your car to be parked in a, in a spot there. She wants to buy time for her father. She wants him to live longer. And so this comparison between her father's life and the time left on a meter is a surprise, a swerve. The children hide before the television. This is more straight ahead. We understand very clearly the te children watching television. Hide, though. They hide before it. That means they're avoiding probably the hospital room, the grown-ups who might be talking about what to do after the father dies, who knows. So there's a little bit of swerving there with the word hide. But the children hide before the television, shivering in its glacial light. The idea of them shivering conveys some of the emotion of the poem. It is a cold feeling that someone is dying, that we're soon going to be mourning and grieving. It's not a warm, fuzzy thought. So shivering is a good choice here. And then glacial. The word glacial underscores the frigid, cold feeling. And the idea that the light from the television is glacial, it seems very accurate because Television and other screens really do have a fluorescent feel to them or a, um, a blue spectrum feel. They, they do feel icy, glacial, this light that, that comes from screens. And she underscores that cold feeling. So this is a swerve. This counts as a swerve, the glacial light. And shivering, I rub these words together. Again, we're surprised. Normally we rub wood together to get a spark, but she's going to rub words together because she's a poet. She's hoping that writing the poem will bring some warmth, some inspiration, this spark. So she's using an interesting metaphor, comparing rubbing wood together for fire to writing a poem to try to bring some spark of life into this situation or warmth or heat, some comfort. And I want to point out the word shivering as well. She repeats the word shivering. Re repetition can be too much straight ahead for the reader. Sometimes we can repeat and it's boring. But when she uses shivering, she's switching up the word order that we're expecting. The children shiver, but shivering I rub puts shivering before the I, the subject of the sentence. So it's interesting. It's a swerve. And all of these elements make the poem a joy to read. We feel the creativity, the originality. It's not so straight ahead that we're bored. It's not so swervy that we're lost. So I hope you feel like you have some tools to make your poems better. I hope you'll include some swerves, some chants, as well as enough predictability or expectedness to keep the reader from getting totally lost. Good luck.